Okay, we're back live here inside the Cube. This is live in San Francisco. <laughs> this is the Cube. We're here in San Francisco for GE's um, Industrial Cloud event. This is our wrap up. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante and Jeff Kelly. And it's a big announcement by GE talking about their relationship with Pivotal Amazon, really expanding on the industrial internet, the internet of things. Essentially everything's connected from sensors to mobile devices to essentially the industrial, the business internet. And our own Jeff Kelly was on stage with uh, uh, Werner Vogels, the CTO of Amazon, as well as the CEO of Pivotal, Paul Moritz, and Jeff Kelly, the, the, the number one big data analyst, introducing new research. Uh, guys, welcome to the wrap-up. Jeff, congratulations on uh, your uh, awesome uh, presentation of the data. So let's talk about the, the event. Let's first get into it. You were on stage uh, with, the, with uh, those luminaries. And Wikibon.org, uh, Wikibon Project introduced uh, some, some significant research. Again, another groundbreaking report by Wikibon, um, cutting edge in the emerging sector of industrial energy. What did you share uh, with folks on the panel, um, led by Beth Comstock, uh, uh, big time GE executive, and she was moderating the panel that you were a uh, domain expert on. So share with us what you, what you talked about. Sure, well we talked about um, kind of the development of this new uh, platform um, to really leverage the industrial internet and some of the requirements um, that, that, that such a platform needs to have. I mean, we, you know, when we look at the industrial internet and what, what it's really all about, I mean, there is certainly a scale question. Um, you know, there's the data in the industrial internet sector is growing twice uh, at twice the speed of other big data uh, sources. Uh, but for me, the real story is the potential value of Leveraging all that data generated in the industrial internet. Um, so when you talk about the industries that we're th that are that we're talking about here, we're talking about healthcare, uh, we're talking about energy, transportation. These are these are sectors that touch all you know m manner of, of uh, society. Uh, they cross political boundaries, social, uh, geopolitical. So the idea here is that really the value of bringing together all this data associated with the industrial internet, um, leveraging that data, analyzing it, optimizing processes, and ultimately allowing uh, companies in these uh, critical industrial sectors to develop new business models, new ways to serve uh, customers and citizens, um, really impacts, you know, a, a, a gonna have a much bigger impact um, on, a, on a kind of a relative size percentage, uh, size-wise, than the commercial uh, big data world, if you will. So that's kind of where we, um, th some of the key findings we had in our research. Uh, you had David Floyer on, I think, earlier today, and he talked a little bit more about some of the numbers in terms of the spend. Uh, we see this moving to about a $500 billion sp uh, spend environment in, in 2020. I think it's going to create somewhere in the order of $1.2 trillion in value. So it's obviously a big opportunity, uh, both for the vendors involved, but also for kind of society at large. So one of the things that was tweeted about, obviously, the two, two X growth of the data versus other, other sectors was one notable. The other one was this business value. Just elaborate on uh, with that. That seemed to get a, a lot of great reactions on Twitter and within the audience and among the panelists. This notion of value, because the, d the value proposition kind of is in the eye of the beholder. I mean, sure, <laughs> and driving some predictive analytics for ads is one thing, but you know, for for the example you use was uh, uh, getting medicine to a, a patient. Expand on the other areas of value that you. Here. Right. Well, uh, as I said, because of the very nature of the industries involved, the the impact of outcomes in those industries just uh, are just kind of dwarf in terms of their their um, their impact, kind of just dwarf the value um, and the importance of uh, some of the activities you'll see in the more commercial side of big data. And that's not to say that the some of the things uh, that we're seeing in the commercial side, like retailers looking to understand uh, sentiment analysis in the tw uh, tweet stream, for instance, or place a, you know the next best ad in front of a, a consumer on the internet. Um, but when you think about the outcomes in healthcare, for example, um, so you know, think about the consequences of um, you know delivering the wrong advertisement to a online web surfer versus the wrong medicine to a critically ill patient, or um, you know, think about the implications of uh, you know an air uh, a jet engine failing mid mid flight versus um, you know you know, not uh, uh, having a system crash that's supporting a, you know, commercial application uh, that sells widgets. So they're both important, they both deliver value, but I think clearly on a societal basis, we can, mo most of us can agree that some of the healthcare, transportation, energy um, use cases uh, are really going to drive significantly more value and, and just have a wider impact across, across society at large. Dave Vellante, the uh, co-founder and uh, chief analyst at Wikibon, obviously the founder, <laughs> co-founder of Wikibon. Great to see your research up there being highlighted. Wha what's your take? What's your analysis? Well, this is big, as we've talked about. In fact, you and I, John, collaborated on a, a piece when uh, uh, Pivot, uh, GE made the, annou uh, the announcement that's going to invest $105 million into Pivotal. And what was significant about that in, in, 
you know, the collaboration that we had was, this is the next wave of big data apps, and it was a real differentiator from sort of, you know, the traditional Hadoop distributions, and we've always seen that as sort of a, of a commodity. But I, I will say this, so this huge opportunity, Jeff talk, just talked about half of, half a trillion dollar TAM. There's a lot of work to be done here, and that's why I think, <coughs> you know, <laughs> GE's pretty ambitious. I mean, this is big money, and it's big challenges. So there's some real headwinds here. There's a real lack of data standards, <coughs> these have to be developed and, and it takes a company like GE and it takes an ecosystem to allow those standards to emerge and it needs leadership and GE, we heard from Bill Roos, providing <coughs> you know, a lot of investment, a billion dollar investment over a few years. It's, it's, it's got gonna be up to, I think a said a, he said a thousand engineers in its uh, facility out here. Um, so they're putting the investments in, but still, again, a lot of, a lot of headwinds. The other piece is there's real no industrial internet platform we talk about the industrial cloud but so you, you've got sensors that are capturing data they're processing data locally they're distributing that data uh, they're connecting to other networks that will create value uh, they're <coughs> providing in what I call industrial analytics on top of that no standards have emerged <laughs> as to what that platform is and I think that's what GE and Pivotal are trying to to build out with its ecosystem so it's a very early days and I think the third really challenge here uh, in terms of adoption is engineers. Engineers that are used to, hey, these, this works. I don't want to hyper automate it. I'm afraid to hyper automate it. So you're going to have to, there's going to have to be a cultural shift as well. And that's why you need a company like GE that is a recognized leader. And I think you need others. There was a question today about, well, what if another big competitor comes out and announces its industrial internet? Well, let's hope they do. Uh, and in a way, IBM Smarter Planet Initiative now has has really high quality company. I think you know you'd like to see Hitachi in here doing some similar types of initiatives, and then you know coagulating some standards around that because this is an enormous opportunity that can have huge impacts on on GDP, improvements in productivity, and improvement in pe improvements in people's lives. Yeah, Dave, you and I have always talked about the um, you know going back to the Wi-Fi wireless days. You, we saw sensors, and we saw them on wireless devices, and obviously with video surveillance post 9/11, that created essentially homeland security now we've seen all the dilemma with the <laughs> NSA and <laughs> surveillance but ultimately now with mobile and connected devices on the consumer side that certainly has shown the business model on the on the uh, on the industrial or business side you're talking heavy machinery manufacturing turbines airplanes uh, telematics a lot, of, a lot of automobile conversations in healthcare etc so the question I want to ask you guys is um, that's great the consumerization has led the trend Jeff um, what, what are you finding in the data with the technologies, because still, we're seeing the cloud war still on the <laughs> consumerization side, mm -hmm. as well as the IT side. So if it's consumer, IT, and then kind of industrial in that order, in terms of adoption, we're still kind of in the middle innings of the just consumer business, never mind you know the early innings of the uh, enterprise play. What's your take on the stacks, the tech, and, and the offerings? Yeah, we're very much at the beginning of this process. I think the low-hanging fruit, um, really, uh, you know, the, it's very. I think it's a very uh, easy to understand business proposition when you know GE or someone else comes in and says, "Look, we can help you run your machines more efficiently using this data, kind of on a machine-to-machine -machine basis." Uh, but then to extend that to a network of machines, whether it's you know not just one wind uh, turbine, but uh, all the turbines that make up one wind farm and making those work together. Um, as Dave said, there's the standards aren't really there to, to kind of uh, connect all these devices, multiple different types of devices, different types of data. Um, and if you think about the level of orchestration and workflow that needs to go into this uh, in order to really leverage this, where um, you know a, a machine creates you know a certain data type, analytics take place, it needs to kick off another series of processes, uh, which then in turn create their own data, which need to be analyzed, then kick off more processes. So these all need to be connected. They have to be intelligent. Um, so we're looking at you know things like machine learning, um, you know, open and hopefully um, you know commonly accepted standards to to improve communication and networking of these devices. Um, you know, applications that actually deliver on uh, value in terms of business uh, business value in terms of real use cases. Um, so there's a long way to go. Uh, certainly, I think GE understands this. GE is an interesting position because they're coming at this from the machine perspective. You know, they are the the industrial equipment manufacturer maker. Um, so they're coming at it from, from the machine perspective. You look at somebody like IBM, they're coming at it from the software perspective. Um, so I think it's, you know, on GE's part, a really smart move to, to partner with someone like Pivotal. They recognized that they were going to need uh, the help of smart people like Paul Moritz and uh, Scott Yard to help build this new platform of the future. And they're really going to try to leverage this platform to serve across all their lines of business. 
So, Dave, I want to get to you in this, this wrap-up because this is where we kind of have to play your, you know, you said talk about horses for courses. The races aren't even being run yet, so they don't even know what kind of horse, horses they need to run on whatever course it is. So the message of open seems to be GE's take. So is that a good play for them? Obviously, it gives them a little bit of an option to, to play, the, play whatever that comes down, on, down the track for them. Yeah, well, John, I was going to sit and ask, I was wanted to have you weigh in here because one of the things I'm personally excited about is the degree to which open source is really now finding its way into virtually every, you know, technology business. Now the latest is in industrial internet. So, John, I mean, you are one of the most, you know, biggest proponents of open source that, that I've met. I mean, w what's your take on this? Um, well, I think my, well, first of all, I love the internet of things. I've always been in fascinated since 2001, really when wireless hit the scene, I loved, it was pretty obvious that this vision was going to take place when and where into what the platforms would be, would be the question. I think now, um, to me, this industrial internet, this industrial cloud, I, I think it's just kind of pre-packaging of what will happen. And I don't think there's a name for that yet. And I'll give you an example. To me, you know, in 1993, the, the word was information superhighway. That basically described the internet. And then, you know, Tim Berners-Lee started the web, uh, HTTP protocol, and, and uh, HTML became the web, and the web became what we all used. So back then, that was the word. So to me, this feels a lot like the information superhighway. Sounding, a really killer sounding word. It's impressive, uh, but ultimately, that's not what became the reality in the marketplace, and I think that's something that I'm seeing. Also, with open source, you're going to see things like OpenStack and the cloud wars continue to, to expand. I think at the end of the day, it's going to come down to SLAs, who can deliver, because I don't want my airplane turbine data going across, up, oh, ops are down, plane's not functioning. So you can't, you need real time, you need really high end ops. And I think that's going to be a challenge. I think it's going to be very early. What, what did Ed Dubbill call it, call it on the cube? The, the data superhighway. Yeah, right? the data superhighway. <laughs> and I think he's right, breaking yeah. down the silos. But at the end of the day, you know, data is like what packets were. So like to me, another metaphor I, we brought up earlier was the local area networking days, the mm -hmm. internetworking. You know, TCP IP, as you remember, Dave, we were in the industry then, enabled massive wealth creation. You know, 3Com, Cisco, those companies were born out of that new standard. So to me, I think your question about open source is the, is the issue. There are no more standards bodies anymore, in my opinion. It's all about the, the communities. Open source communities are the new standards bodies, and that is where things will get ratified. And I think from there, you'll see the market really lift and then as people get direction, the fog will lift around where it goes, but ultimately that is going to be the, the, the telltale sign is what happens in open source, what happens in cloud, and what happens at the edge of the network, that's mobile, that's probe. So software at the edge, that's data, and data, data will be the packet. So event management, processing, event streams, these are the tech, these are metaphors we've seen with network management, and again, networking. So I think networking is going to be a kind of paradigm we'll see instead of packets, it's data. Um, and the stack instead of TCP IP is going to be some sort of interoperable fashion. And there's a lot of propriety in the machines that are out installed, you know, the GE cells, and EMC's never really been a, a, a big producer of open source technologies, but that's the beauty of open source. I mean, you saw IBM turn on a dime, you know, Lou Gerson called it a recovering alcoholic, and they became a huge proponent of open source, and that I think is the beauty of, of, this, of this model. And then I guess the other observation is you got companies like GE, obviously a lot bigger than EMC, but both of them, you know, it's the old Jack Welch, you want to be number one and number two in your markets, and you want to focus on markets that are large and growing fast, and that's something that I know f personally from watching EMC all these years that they've done very, very well. Clearly, GE is going after you know a next wave of value creation for its shareholders and its customers. And so those are two very exciting trends that, as I say, a lot of challenges, but challenges mean you need big companies with a lot of resources to solve them, and the end result, potentially, is a lot of reward. Well, that's the wrap up. Any final thoughts, Jeff? Um, I'll see you sitting next to some pretty big names up there. Paul Moritz, uh, did you get him on, you know, put a cube plug in there? Well, we did our best, yeah. Paul, you know, Paul from Moritz, you have to come on the cube waiting for well, you. Well, we've got a spot for you, Paul, whenever you're ready. The other, the other <laughs> fascinating thing that I got, I found out, this was uh, Leo, who does the M&A for Pivotal, laid out in the cube here, Dave, which is fascinating, because we've been watching the inside baseball and VMware EMC for years, and to have him kind of give us some insight into a lot of the Pivotal gaming that was went on around how to organize, the, you say, Misfit Toys, but the different components of VMware, which weren't weren't materializing very well under the current the old regime of VMware. VMware was too big of a of an organization, had too much legacy going on at the data fabric layer, and obviously you know vSphere and among other things with virtualization. That was just too much for Pivotal really to get any kind of traction. And to me, it was just they didn't have enough you know runway. Yeah, and EMC was a storage to uh, storage stovepipe essentially, and so now they've extracted those and boom, yeah. put them into this hot new entity. So it's my great my, move. my my prediction is that you're going to see you know the architecture of what 
that Leo put together with Joe Tucci, Goulden, and Gelsinger. And Moritz is essentially an organization that's decoupled Okay, and highly cohesive. So you're going to see some great interaction. You're going to see Pivotal probably expand heavily. I think Pivotal's going to have a nice run. I think got all the elements. They got a lot more work to do in the white spaces, which you know he didn't really answer the white space question. But I think clearly they're going to be going on an M A spree. Mm -hmm. I think for Pivotal, it's, it'll be interesting to see how they develop um, because they have taken some heat in the Hadoop and open source community for taking a bit of a proprietary approach um, with Pivotal HD. And so we're here at the G event talking about being open and open standards and and things like that. So well, they they, they, they no, they use open standards, but for their solution, it's proprietary. So again, this is going to be the question that we've always asked in the cube: will there be a Red Hat for Hadoop? And I think the answer is slowly becoming the only Red Hat of Hadoop will be Red Hat, <laughs> which will buy Hortonworks, <laughs> <laughs> possibly, uh, or somebody else. So the only Red Hat of Hadoop will be whoever they buy. The Red Hat. And then right. Red Hat will be the Red Hat of Hadoop, and they'll have their own distribution. But The answer was staring us in the face the whole time. <laughs> I think, I think the, you know, Hadoop distribution is a standard, but you can sit on top of it, so we're seeing some emerging paradigms there. Yeah. I mean, whether it's security or whether it's API management, that's going to be something we're going to watch. Well, so and I do think, to your point, that, that Pivotal will have to become, you know, more of a contributor to the open source community. I think it's just, I think it's going to become a fundamental require over the requirement over the next five years, and, I, and frankly, I think they will. I think the market will drive them. EMC, VMware, they're very market driven, so, mm -hmm. you know, maybe they don't have to be the purest of Hortonworks, but, well, right, no one's not suggesting they need to be a purist, but uh, the, the one of the key questions about this business is where do you add the IP and and how do you monetize it? Well. Open to proprietary. I mean, that's that's the equation that the all these vendors need to figure out, and, and they're all kind of taking different approaches. Right, but services is one way, but it's not the only way. Right. It's a good way. I love services. Well, well I mean, no, Dave points it out. I mean, many times on the cube, he asked the guests today, it's the service provider, the technology providers, or solution providers going to provide, you know, for every dollar they sell, the practitioners will be getting a multiple of that, either right. delivery or value. So, you know, I think to me that's pretty clear that's going to be the, uh, the edge of the network. It's going to be app developers. That's going to be, uh, you know, the, the in-between Accenture. I, mean, I see Accenture, you know, essentially prototyping Accenture and giving that out to the channel. So I think Accenture's strategy is pretty uh, relevant. I mean, I like what they're doing. Instead of trying to be the guys to do it all for everybody, they can prefabricate this middle la middle layer, orchestration layer, and provide that on. So I'm, I think that's where the action is going to end up going. And if Pivotal can pull it off, that's where the developers will really make money. Well, and, and so you mentioned Accenture. IBM's obvi obviously got the smarter plan, tons of services there. You know, look for Deloitte and PwC to get into this game. I think they're logical partners of, of GE um, because there's huge opportunities and they have deep industry expertise as well. And, and those four are really the top ones. IBM, PwC, Deloitte, and Accenture, the top four in IT. And I think you'll see them all doing stuff in this space. Right, well let's not forget, look at it from the machine perspective. You've got GE's competitors like United Technologies, Siemens, um, you know, that whole. Hitachi. Hitachi, right. right. So they're, gonna, they're not going to sit back and just let GE take this market. So you're going to see, this, this is going to be the next wave of, of activity. It's going to be among these players, the ones you mentioned on the software and services side. It's going to be on the industrial equipment maker side. Going to see a lot of strange alliances potentially, and it's going to be really interesting to see how this plays out. Okay, this is the Cube Silicon Angles here on the ground in San Francisco, documenting and covering the emerging space of the Internet of Things, the Internet of Everything, industrial Internet, industrial cloud, whatever you want to call it. Beth Comstock was on stage with GE with their executives. You had Paul Moritz. Bernard, Bernard Vogels, Accenture, and Wikibon all on stage leading this trend, and those are the companies that are going to start taking us into this emerging space. So, uh, great event. Go to the hashtag uh, Industrial Cloud to follow all the coverage. We have tweets, we have content. Of course, go to wikibon.org for their recent report on this. It is cutting edge, and obviously go to SiliconANGLE for all the coverage. Uh, this is a, a wrap up here in San Francisco, and we'll be at uh, the Velocity Conference starting tomorrow, so keep, on, keep watching theCUBE. Uh, a lot more events happening in the, the year, and, and uh, thanks for watching.